Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we are coming at you with a very special episode, not unlike the last special episode that we had. We're celebrating the anniversary of a very, very, very special folk album. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Nick Drake's Pink Moon. Indeed. This is an album that turned 50 very recently, and we had a gap in our upload schedule that we decided to fill by celebrating this album. And Mm -hmm. this is one of the most influential folk records of all time, it's fair to say. It has a sort of Nick Drake as a figure, has a kind of cult, almost mythic status as this example of this artist who created this great art while he was alive, then died young and only had his art sort of discovered uh, by the masses after his death. Very much kind of like Vincent van Gogh figure of music to a certain extent. And these kinds of figures tend to get sort of canonized or held up in a particular light. And sometimes that can get in the way of the music and sometimes that can kind of accentuate Uh, the music and the the sort of simple, elegant beauty and sadness within the music. And I think that in the case of Nick Drake, the popularity that he's encountered following his death in the decades since has really been like a shining example of how the seeds of influence can sort of sit for decades before uh, an artist is, is truly acknowledged. And it feels like now that Nick Drake has been canonized as one of the great folk songwriters of his time, that people have widely acknowledged not only the influence of his music, but also how timelessly beautiful it all is. And so it only makes sense, I think, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Pink Moon by talking about this album in particular, um, what it tells us about Nick as a songwriter and as a, mus- and as a musician relative to his other two records, And why it's the record that most people who encounter Nick hear first. For some people, it's probably the only Nick Drake record that they've heard. And why, in particular, this album has the lasting impact and influence and resonance that it has. What's notable about this record from the off is that compared to the two records that preceded it, 1969's Five Leaves Left and 1971's Brighter Later, this is a record that is incredibly stripped down. Now, Nick, who was always a kind of somewhat reclusive, but also kind of ambitious songwriter with with dreams of of making it big, he had this ambition but it was not paired well with the desire to do the things necessary to achieve success through the machinations of the record industry in England in the late 60s and early 70s he wasn't really all that keen on publicity he did not do well in interviews he had a number of very poor experiences performing live that caused him to withdraw from that setting And very much it it felt like an example of an artist whose art was so profound and moving and powerful to the people who knew it, but who was so hampered by the requirements of what you had to do in order to have your art heard and disseminated and become a part of the culture at the time. And so what's interesting is that Nick tried with his first two records teaming up with Uh, his long-term collaborator, the producer and composer, Joe Boyd, Nick was able to compose and craft these two records, Five Leaves Left and Brighter Later, which were ornate, which were pretty, which were layered, which were lush, um, which at times were spare, but have a lot of sort of timeless beauty and ornate flourishes in them that very much bear the influence of singer-songwriters like Van Morrison, for instance. Um, But Nick, I think, was disillusioned by the fact that despite putting so much effort and craft into those records, they failed to succeed commercially, and they were largely critically ignored, and when they were critically reviewed, they were not reviewed favorably. I think people in that time in particular, because there was, people were unable to really see Nick as a figure, see Nick as a compelling person or a compelling personality his music was pretty quickly disregarded for that reason so 
Nick was very disillusioned even by the failure of his first record. And so when his second record failed as well, it felt very much like, because that was a record brighter later as a record where relative to five leaves left, Nick makes some concessions to craft songs that might have a broader appeal songs like fly and Northern sky, which are some of the most accessible Nick Drake songs. But I think the disillusionment with that failure led Nick further into a kind of downward spiral and, concert with his continued and increased drug use at the time as well and so what happened is that almost spontaneously with very little warning um, Nick had no longer the collaborative partnership with Joe Boyd who I believe had moved to America and so instead was forced to team up with the engineer John Woods who had worked on his first two records along with Nick and Joe Boyd but here was his only sole collaborator and Nick brought forth these songs that comprise the album Pink Moon and they were recorded in the dead of night uh, in a studio where I believe they had to be as quiet as possible and they recorded them in only two nights and that was it the album was just recorded very quickly Nick had brought these very sparse and spare songs completely prepared to lay them down and so Pink Moon was released on Island Records the label that had re released his previous two records as well although again they were not particularly fond of Nick nor did they particularly have aspirations for him anymore at this point nevertheless this album was interestingly given more publicity and push from the label than either of his two previous releases which resulted in the album being released in the US before Nick had even died as well which was a first time thing for him the reception critically was a little warmer than it had been on his previous records but it seemed as though critics were more than ever kind of less interested in Nick as a proposition and commercially the album didn't really take off either for reasons that I think are even more easy to understand when you take this record for what it is and you um, examine it because sure there were lots of artists who were doing this spare minimal folk music around this time but there's an aloofness and a distance to Nick that you very much get I think listening to this record he has no real desire to connect with other people what he does seem to do on this record is is sort of impart some personal wisdom to the listener that for the most part feels kind of cynical and pessimistic about how the world will essentially ignore you will not acknowledge the things that you give to it that choice is kind of an illusion is one theme that i think he sort of touches on in some of these songs it's a very sort of fatalistic record. It has a few glimmers of potential hope. It has some sense of, of generic wonder at nature and the world, but overall a pessimistic view about, at the very least, Nick's and maybe in general humanity's place in that. Uh, Jake, I'm curious what your perception is or the vibe atmosphere you get from this record when you listen to it and, and what sort of stands out about the listening experience of Pink Moon. I think the thing that caught me off guard when I listened to Pink Moon for the first time, which I discovered because, of, you know, say it with me, kids, it was the highest rated folk rock album on SputnikMusic.com. So I listened to it a long time ago and I was just kind of taken aback at how like truly minimal it was. I know we've kind of gone out of our way to sort of state how it really is just kind of a, a very simplistic stripped back album. But um I think that really it sort of gets to the heart of Nick as an artist, sort of the the stripping back being the the all revealing sort of all encompassing work that someone ends up being known for, which is, I think, kind of poetic because one of the artists that Nick is most often compared to and sort of in hindsight sort of seen as like a precedent for is Elliot Smith. And I think it's basically inarguable that if we're going to compare these two, uh, you know, folk rock legends at this point, that this is very much his uh, version of either or, which is you take an album where you sort of abandon what you were building off of. You sort of have the still comparatively kind of minimal sounds, the sort of uh, pastoral Baroque chamber folk kind of 
you know, bells and whistles and you kind of do away with them so that you can focus and hone in on the personality, the songwriting, like the core of what you really go to about these records. And I find it poetic too that we're doing this right after we talk about uh, the Mountain Goats All Hail West Texas, because I feel as though this is an album that utilizes a very similar effect where the intimacy of the recording um, and the simplicity of everything is sort of what draws you in, what keeps you there, what makes it interesting and sort of the, the overall draw of it. But the effect it creates is entirely different. Whereas John Darnielle uses the simplistic stripped back recording to create a sense of grounded, intimate realism. Nick Drake uses this to create an almost wondrous kind of sweeping sense of pastoral melancholy of like there isn't there is an intimacy to it there's not really a distance i would say but there is a a scale and scope that pink moon has that you don't really get from a lot of albums like it which is why i think it's sort of held in the esteem that it is even above nick's other work it's sort of you know it's definitely a departure from what he's done before as you know, you go back and you listen to something like Brighter Later and um, Five Leaves Left is that those are albums that sound orchestrated. They sound like they are the work of a season, seasoned, uh, like someone who is really focusing on the art of composition. Whereas this feels more like an exercise in pure musical form. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it too, it's just so kind of, aesthetically unassuming i mean other than nick himself the guitar and i think a piano that really only appears on one track on here yeah that's basically it mm. and you also see the runtime which is south of 30 minutes so you're just kind of like you know what can an album with such limitations like that even achieve in its slight runtime and stripped back approach i mean even something like all hail west texas takes you know 40 ish minutes and some great poetry but even here the lyricism is notably as stripped back as the instrumentation at points there is one instrumental on here and a lot of the choruses are only said once here a lot of the songs maybe are one or two stanzas long i think the longest song on here isn't even four minutes so you know again it's difficult i guess these days to sort of approach an album like this with the legacy that it has and with, you know, all of the, the accolades and the newfound appreciation people have for it is that I can see why someone might go into it and be slightly underwhelmed. Yet my experience with it was never as such. I I've always found this to be a warm, intimate record. And that was sort of the, the main draw of it at first is the atmosphere of the album that really catches you off guard before anything else. The sound of Nick's very light, plaintive, airy vocals that are very smooth, very like, I would describe almost as distant and ethereal, but there is something enveloping about them. There's, a, they have a lot of presence in the mix, whereas the guitar is like a little tiny bit further bit back, but not all that much. But really, it makes you hone in on like you sort of appreciate the aesthetic vibe of the record, which is stripped back, sure. But there is something to its intimacy. So then it sort of lets you in on what you're really there for, which is the album's content, which is weird because you take a look at it. And a lot of Nick's writing here is very oblique. It's very, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's very metaphorical. It's very slanted and kind of wry you you can't really get a full grasp on it the first one or two times that you listen to it like even comparatively speaking i think that something like brighter later is much easier to interpret and understand because that's an album that deals with far less ugly themes because i see pink mood as an album primarily about alienation nick is sort of constantly in a state of acknowledging his place in the universe and the place of everyone else and the disparity between the two and is constantly trying to articulate that and on some songs you kind of feel in real time the struggle to like to try and articulate it and almost a failure to do so which makes the melancholy feel all the more creeping and omnipresent i find mm. 
You mentioned Elliot Smith, and I think that's an interesting comparison to make with regard to their careers. I mean, obviously, there's some surface level aesthetic comparisons as well, and they're not dissimilar songwriters in some respects, but you could almost view them as having, within their short lifetimes, inverse career trajectories in the sense that Elliot started as this fairly unguarded and minimal and, and quite sort of stark songwriter with his first three records and then gradually became more ornate, gradually found ways to accentuate his songwriting, to expand it outwards a little bit, to move away from some of the more just sort of, not two-dimensional, but some of the more kind of central songwriting focuses that he'd had and, and become somewhat more ambitious as he, his career developed. Whereas Nick kind of is the inverse of that. Nick tries to hide himself in some ways behind some of these compositions that he has outside help uh, with composing on his earlier records and it very much feels like as his career progresses across those admittedly brief three records he gradually is guarding himself less and less from the listener which is interesting to consider in terms of contrasting it with his life at the time where he became more and more guarded, more and more withdrawn, more and more quiet, uh, more and more antisocial uh, by accounts of the last years of his life. It's intriguing to read about the final years of Nick's life and, and the struggles that he had with mental illness and depression and just a general distance from society that felt, feels very felt in the songs on this record and tracks like Parasite, for instance. Mm -hmm. But um, to contrast that with how naked and revealing these songs are, it feels very much like, and again, I don't want to project onto Nick's life. I just want to talk about the effect of, of the music here. It feels very much like this is the only mode through which Nick can truly communicate. And even then, it's a, it's a limited communication. It's a distanced communication. It's a communication in short fragments of lyrics. It's a communication in sound and in through the playing of his acoustic guitar as well. One of the interesting things I learned reading about his life from snippets of his biography is that uh, his mother would describe his when he lived at home with her, which he did in the final days of his life, a lot of his time would be spent in the late hours of the night, just sort of playing the acoustic guitar and sort of experimenting with unusual tunings and trying to see what sorts of sounds and feelings he could wring out of the guitar itself. And so in many ways, it feels as though uh, this album, in as much as it is an exercise for Nick in expressing how he's feeling through the minimal but poetic lyricism, you also get this strong impressionistic acoustic guitar playing from him that has this subtle sense of uh, nuance and complexity in certain elements, but is very sharp and pronounced and memorable and, and simplistic in other ways as well. A lot of the simple chord progressions and, and acoustic melodies on this record are very easy to get sort of stuck in your head and to remember. And, and I think that's, the relationship between those simple and sparse but somewhat affecting and immediate melodies and Nick's sentiments on this record are a big part of why it is such a striking listen I think why it sticks with people so much because even if you had these exact same songs but you had them more ornate and more fleshed out with additional instrumentation there would be some aspect of the power and simplicity that is lost here um, and so I think that that Nick's decision to have these songs unadorned and is, is as much a, a reflection of his disillusionment with the failure of his previous records as it is a desire to kind of get to the core of like his songwriting and his musicianship and what he's trying to do. He is opening himself up and revealing himself and almost it almost feels as though by the time you get to the end of this record Nick has done that so completely and so purely that he has nothing left and and that then his his subsequent decline and death sort of have this additional poignancy and again I'm reading into it to a certain extent there I can't know how Nick felt but there is a sense of finality to Pink Moon, to listening to this album in the context of Nick's career. There's a sense of 
lingering death in a strange way. Uh, but it's almost the death that Nick is able to make peace with. He's bitter, but he's he's disillusioned from the world and he has this sense of cynicism about you know, the nature of things and the way that human beings operate and his place within society. But he also has this sense of acceptance and even peace with regard to his fate and where he is now. Uh, which is, uh, you know, th those are mixed emotions and that state of mind. I mean, it's a difficult thing to reconcile and it's a troubling thing. And, you know, it takes a lot of energy out of you to process it emotionally when you listen to the record. But um, that to me is the impression I get when I listen to these songs. And um, it, it's one of the things I think that makes Pink Moon such an arresting experience and why it lingers so strongly with people and why we're talking about it 50 years later. Yeah, I think that the the lyrical content of the album, honestly, like once you really parse through it, is it, it's just it's surprisingly embittered. Like there is definitely that resignation to to one sense of fate, that sort of finality in it. But you look at it, and it's just that's you can tell that the that Nick, like from this mode, from this like artistic expression that he was in at one point incredibly frustrated with his place in the world, even from the title track, which is the first song on here, which is like, you know, it's gorgeous. The accenting pianos are lovely, but this is a song that's really about alienation and bitterness. The promise of whatever this pink moon being uh, written or said is uh, coming along to almost humble or humiliate on those who Nick speaks about as if he's the, the, the person who is sort of, you know, the word I'm looking for here is lost. Like he's an oracle of some kind that's talking about some kind of oncoming plague or something. And um, immediately there's also Place to Be, which is uh, pick and favorite songs on here is tough, but Place to Be is definitely up there for me. It's a song that's about longing to be young, but also sort of how naive was or how naive Nick was when he was younger, thinking about how he'd grow older and understand the world. And how like, you know, the clean the place is like a metaphor that seems to be an allusion to the responsibilities of adulthood, making it seem rendered kind of mundane and ordinary. And he compares geological phenomenon to where he is in his life, the dark seas, the green hills, the green being a reference to how immature he is or feels. And just the simplicity of the chord progression here is, mm -hmm. is so, so mm -hmm. stark and beautiful. He has, I think, one of the ways in which Nick structures this record is through the cycle of day through night and then through to day again. Like there are recurring references. Obviously, the moon and the sun are recurring images and symbols that are represented here. The cycle of nature. Um, there is a sense through this record that Nick is acknowledging the kind of perennial plowing onward of the world where people are only transitory and can only exist for a certain time and are ultimately at the whim of that endless cycle that will trudge forward that has trudged forward since before they existed and will continue to trudge forward long after they're gone there is a sense of surrender to that there's a sense of understanding your insignificance in the context of a world that will continue of a day that will turn to night that will turn to day that will turn to night again and again and again and there's also a sense of of second chances as well, a, second, a sense of renewed hope buried here through the idea that each night will become a day, that each day will become a new night. I mean, some of the lyrical motifs and metaphors that Nick uses are simplistic and pretty straightforward here, but they he, he is able to create a potency out of the immediacy and out of the sense of a universal understanding inherently that we all can feel from these metaphors and comparisons because we all inherently understand how the day and how the night make us feel. Nick has regular allusions to color as well. He uses the language of color to signal mood and feeling, although he does it, I think, in a slightly less 
conventional way than you might expect. Uh, the pink moon itself is, is the most obvious example of this. It's ambiguous what exactly the pink moon means. It seems to be a threat to others, but not to Nick. It seems to be the symbol of something oncoming, uh, as you said, that the people not, are not necessarily prepared for. But it's an interesting description that I think is difficult to initially read in a way that makes it a fascinating lyrical motif that makes it stick in the mind, that makes it stick in the memory. It's not clear if the pink moon itself is this image of retribution, of, of fire in the sky, or whether it is this image of love, of forgiveness, of second chances, as I say. I think that the choice to describe the moon in this way, as opposed to like a blood moon or, or whatever else, is meaningful and I think lets you see where Nick is coming from in terms of the way you choose to interpret this world is going to be a reflection of you and of the kind of personality that you are and where you are at, whether the pink moon itself is something to be feared or something to be embraced. And of course, he on place to be, he, he refers to himself using the language of colors as well. He says, I was greener than the hill. Now I'm weaker than the palest blue, right? Quite simple stuff, but it provides a motif that hangs through these songs that allows you, I think, to get a little bit closer to Nick, to understand him a little bit more through this very sort of straightforward language of poetry. Nick continues with the allusions to the sun and moon on a track like Road as well, where, again, he uses this language to distance himself from others. You can say the sun is shining if you really want to. I can see the moon and it seems so clear. This idea that what you, you and I are staring up at the sky and we are seeing we are staring up at the sky together, but we are seeing different things. You can take a road that takes you to the stars now. I can take a road that will see me through. Nick continues that sense of distance and isolation through which will, where Nick, I guess, acknowledges the sense to which he doesn't understand even the people that are closest to him in his life, the sense to which he cannot know what they are thinking and what they will do, whether they will choose him, whether they will choose to leave him behind. I think that alienation that you spoke of is elaborated even more intimately and beautifully in some of those songs as well. Yeah, Road is one of my favorite songs on here, too, because it shows that he speaks of sort of, you know, himself and of someone else showing a, a differing perspective between the two. But the inherent separation physically that that perspective causes, illuminating two different paths in life, a path that will take others to the stars. And whereas Pat, Nick's path will you know, see him through the it's oblique, but it's obviously like kind of pessimistic. And as we said, disillusioned, it has kind of a spry and upbeat chord progression that kind of implies a sort of travel or movement, which I think isn't a mistake. I also was just listening to this and was like, God damn, this is like the, the blueprint for Phil Elverum is just it's just this album and this song. That's it's it's a lot of that. And yeah, he's Rich obviously Will. a sun, a sun and moon. He obviously uses that yep. the language of those um, a lot as well. So yeah, and which will is like it's kind of got an Americana vibe with the guitar here. It's kind of like a it's like a direct response to Rhodes. Sort of like most of the songs here, in my opinion, they sort of come in twos, like the cycle. You know that you're alluding to. It's sort of like a reflection on the choices and paths in road. Nick is resigned to the hopelessness of his path and the sadness that comes being the only lonely man on it. But he dreamily contemplates the possibilities of the paths unavailable to him. There's a, a hopeless bitterness that's just kind of aching here. And I almost think it kind of goes into horn too, because it's the, it's the minimal instrumental, but the sparse kind of lonely chords being plucked here feel like a meditation on the, the singularity, the loneliness, the hopelessness that the previous tracks imply. It's the saddest sounding song on the album to me. It's the, like the sound of clouds covering up a sunny horizon to yield a dreary, endless day. Beautifully said. And you have these two, what I think of as two of the central tracks in the center of this record, Things Behind the Sun and Parasite. Mm -hmm. These are two of Nick's most enduring songs. And I think they 
they are some of the most, for lack of a better word, elaborate or kind of detailed songs from a lyrical perspective. There are some of the songs that have the most dense lyricism as, as far as this record goes anyway. Things Behind the Sun. Um, my, my favorite song on this record tends to vary, but at the moment I think it might be this uh, because for one, it has one of the most beautiful guitar progressions on this record, I think, in the sense that mm -hmm. there are it dips between minor minor chord playing and major chord playing, but there is also these beautiful little finger picking things that he does that gives each chord he plays this additional sense of kind of weight, whether it's a kind of heft and a doom in the minor chords, or whether it's a kind of uh, uplifting sense of hope in the major chords which then becomes sour there's this really kind of neat simplistic complexity if that is a term I can even use uh, in the playing here and the way that he describes the distance and coldness that he feels please be aware of them that steer they'll only smile to see you while your time away and once you've seen what they have been to win the earth just won't seem worth your night or your day this yeah again the sense of it's a sense of alienation it's a sense of coldness it's a sense of distance but there's also a sense within the chorus when those major chords come in of reassurance of nick speaking to the listener in a way in which it feels like there is a communion with them which is rare for this record to be honest because so much of it is dour and bleak and nick lingering in his darkness and not really offering anything to the listener beyond his own dour state of mind but when he says take your time and you'll be fine and say a prayer for the people there who live on the floor and if you see what's meant to be don't name the day or try to say it happened before there is something within that i think that nick is reaching out in a certain way and it makes it a really profound and powerful moment on the record i think and it's yeah especially the part in the song where you just the, the words kind of fall away and he's just kind of like repeating and, and reiterating and elaborating on these little melodic motifs that I, I i really find it quite powerful yeah i think that if i have any like criticisms of the album which are very slight because i love the record a lot it's the song between things behind the sun and parasite which are again to really substantial moments on the record is uh no which i don't think is a, a bad song or anything it's just it's the most lyrically scant and repetitive song on the album it's kind of just my least favorite through you know process of elimination i guess uh lyrically there's basically four lines here but they purposefully contradict one another like nick is sort of living in a state of flux loving but not caring present but still absent and you know I, I like it it's good it just doesn't feel like it carries maybe the same weight as something like parasite where you know opens with nick talking about stealing the mask of a local clown which i figured might be a you know oblique reference to something like Pagliacci or something but sort of you know implying at that sort of in that omnipresent sadness that exists both within and outside of Nick and he sort of goes into some place I at least my brain interprets it to be as a bar and listening to the woes of customers and lamenting the, uh, that no one's going to care about their sort of trials and tribulations and the second verse which is really dense and I still don't really know how to parse through it myself honestly it seems to be about the ideas of privilege, wealth, religion, and the futility of all of it. And then Nick kind of turns the lens back on himself after criticizing all of these people and taking his lens and sort of casting it outward and then finally casts it back on himself, saying that basically he's nothing more than a parasite clinging to the subject of someone's skirt, sort of siphoning off of these people's pain as an artist and as a songwriter. Mm. Yeah, the way he describes himself as the parasite of this town. I mean, it's one of the most striking lines on the whole record to me. It's one of the, because I've had this record in my life since I was a teenager. And this is, this was the other song that used to be, well, that is kind of vies for my spot of the track I connect to the most on this record. There's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a particularly gnarly and upsetting image for Nick to describe himself with in the context of this album where he typically avoids such 
I guess, vividly strong language. I mean, there's also the line in the song, changing a rope for a size too small, people all get hung. Like, it's just a very, uh, it's a very morbid song, I think, even rel- relative to the other songs in this record. And there's this sense of e- eternal suffering and pain that I think is communicated through this reiterating and kind of endlessly cycling acoustic guitar progression that he plays in this song as well. It's, I think, one of Nick's darkest songs, maybe not the darkest song, um, but it is certainly on this record, it is a moment that is particularly tough to listen to when you're really sitting down to pay attention and trying to uh, understand Nick at this particular point in his life. It's it's, I think, the pinnacle of his hopelessness here. And, and that's maybe a reason why it's endured so much for so many. Uh, I actually am, am fond of No, even if it is definitely the most kind of insubstantial thing here. I like the lyrical minimalism. I think perhaps it would have been better served with a different uh, musical motif than the one yes, that's in the song. But I, I like the simplicity of the sentiment here. And I, I find I've always found it quite haunting ever since i was a child the way he sings on it the kind of you know wordless hums that he does in between lyrics there's this sense of coldness that i get there's a sense of distance here i think nowhere on the record is his distance between himself and even the people that are closest to him his parents his girlfriends his his friends nowhere is i think that more minimally distilled to its essence than here and there is something potently powerful about it. Um, yeah, I, I think that the record continues to display some of Nick's uh, skill and prowess on the acoustic guitar through songs like Free Ride and Harvest Breed, which I'm admittedly not as fond of as some of the songs that we've already talked about, but there is a sense of Nick's uh, playfulness, I think, in the melodic progressions and vocal melodies of Free Ride, which is one of the most kind of hooky songs on the record, for lack of a better word. It feels strange to even call it that. But yeah, that's it's a moment that stands out for that reason. And I think I've talked about the sense of hope that occasionally comes through at select moments on this record. I mean, most prominently the chorus of Things Behind the Sun, but also in From the Morning, the song that closes this record, one of the most beautiful songs Nick ever recorded, I think. And I mean, it's a song in which he sings about beauty. He sings about seeing the world anew through the dawn of a new day and remarking on the beauty of that. And the, the equal beauty of the new day and the new night as well. There, there is a sense in the song of Nick being able to find a moment of splendor within his perpetual darkness, him able to remark on the sights and the endless summer nights, and him imparting on the listener to take away from the things that he has said uh, some kind of lesson, some kind of purpose, not to be to- totally disillusioned or left completely without any purpose in the world. Like there, there is something there that, and and perhaps even go play the game that you learned from the morning. Like I, I even sometimes when I listen to the song, I read it as a song about beyond being beyond death, like death being the 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 dawn itself and then the morning representing some kind of freedom beyond you know being stuck in the tangible world and go play the game that you learned from the morning being a line suggesting like take the lessons you've learned from your you know impermanent and fragile and vulnerable life and apply those to a beauty that becomes unlocked to you once you're freed of you know the tethers of being a human being I don't know. That's how I read the song. Some days I think that it's purposefully oblique and it's uplifting message such that you could read it in a number of different ways, depending on your own mood. But one thing that I feel comes through strongly regardless is that Nick leaves this record on a moment celebrating beauty and it stands in stark contrast to everything that precedes it. And it feels particularly purposeful and I, I'm grateful that it exists for that reason. 
I, I completely co-sign basically everything you said about from the morning because it ties back into something that we've already talked about, that being the sort of idea of the album talking in cycles and my notion that I think a lot of the songs being paired together in the sequencing, I think Harvest Breed and From the Morning are together because Harvest Breed to me is a song about, really is about experiencing death, about experiencing a free fall and sort of the moment where you realize that there's no hope and then eventual acceptance and becoming one with the, the flowers, with nature. And then sort of what happens on from the morning is the sort of the what comes after that the sort of like you've kind of made your peace with it and then it's the enlightening that it come that comes from afterwards that you sort of abandoned all of the like earthly things that keep you bound to your body and now you sort of it's a more of a, a, a spiritual experience of a song to me and that's why I really like that sort of sequencing choice there yeah and all that remains is to see this record's legacy. I mean, it has been cited by so many songwriters as a direct influence. Um, Robert Smith of The Cure has cited it. Kate Bush, Beck, Amy Mann, so many different musicians in the time across various generations of popular music. His influence has grown. I mean, he existed, I think, as mostly a cult artist throughout the 70s and 80s. It wasn't until in 1999 that Volkswagen led a particularly memorable ad campaign that featured the song Pink Moon. And that ad campaign was so successful and that ad itself was so well regarded that Nick Drake's popularity in the US in particular exploded in the early 2000s. And his record sales in the US went from something like 6,000 in 1999 to over 300,000 within the next five years. It was fair to say that that was a, that strange commercial of all things was a moment where Nick suddenly became rediscovered to the population and I mean you could see that timeline coinciding with the timeline of someone like Elliot Smith who we've talked about you could see the the potential place for his music potentially being better accepted and better understood in that era I mean that was also you know the post Jeff Buckley era as well like an era where these you know tragic and melancholic singer songwriters were becoming sort of celebrated and lost and and mythologized and um in some ways reduced by their popularity but also in some ways it's allowed them to be wi more widely recognized it's allowed the music to reach a wider audience it's allowed nick to become or nick's music to become meaningful in a way that it couldn't have been if only a small number of people had heard it and that's why we're discussing it today I mean it feels like it only gets a greater sense of cachet and impact with time um, and and we can only imagine you know how the record will sound and will feel another 50 years from now but I think one thing that's for absolute sh certain is that it will still be around and people will still be listening to it and people will still be taking away from it and making music that is inspired by it in some way. I mean, its influence is just endless. I mean, you already said, you know, people as far removed from the indie folk scene as Robert Smith can cite it as an inspiration. But I mean, like, where even like really more of the moment contemporary artist, where is Phoebe Bridgers without Nick Drake? Where is Sufjan Stevens without Nick Drake? Where is, you know, insert your favorite indie folk artist here. It's like the DNA of everything. There's an argument to be made that this is as influential on this avenue of alternative music as Citizen Kane is in film. I mean, like you just, you can't, it's just one of those, essential pieces that regardless of how much you may personally connect with it it is an essential part of the world's musical dna it's almost as if nick drake was sort of a cipher to embody the shape of music to come like as like it was like art itself willed him into existence in order to create this Mm. If we're to make a film comparison, I'm reminded of the French filmmaker Jean Vigo, who died young 
in the early 30s, only made four movies. Only one of them was a feature film, La Talante. But um, his the, his career and his his work became so huge and enormous and successful and influential very soon after his death, in fact. And, and it became thought of as a sort of tragic loss, yet also a holistically complete statement in terms of his career. So yeah, um, Nick fits into that tradition beautifully and in many ways transcends that tradition and it seems foolhardy and stupid to try and like put him up on some kind of lofty pedestal some kind of like uh you know godlike figure within this tradition of music but it seems also there's fewer there's it's difficult to describe him and accurately capture the impact he's had without resorting to such terms so i'll simply say Nick Drake was a special, special artist, and we are all the better for having experienced and appreciated his work. I feel like with having a more nuanced take on music discussion as a whole, we can sort of take these revered figures like Jeff Buckley, Elliot Smith, and Nick Drake and kind of ground them in a humanity while still giving them the praise that they are so, you know, deserving of uh, in its, all of its totality, because at the end of the day, you want to treat them with the reverence that they're owed and with the like the monumental influence that they hold, but also not to dehumanize them in doing so. All right. Well, let's give our favorite tracks and rating for Nick Drake's Pink Moon. Jake, why don't you go first? My three favorite tracks on here are probably going to be Place to Be, Which Will, and from the morning uh, a lot of great songs on here though least favorite is Pratt's yeah, definitely uh no uh and i give the album a nine out of ten my three favorite songs on this album are going to be parasite things behind the sun and from the morning uh, least favorite track is um yeah i don't want to pick one for this uh i'm going to give it an 8.5 so that gives us an average for nick drake's pink moon of 8.8 let us know at home what this record means to you what nick's music in general means to you what is this your favorite nick drake album is it not your favorite nick drake album uh we want to hear your opinions your thoughts your comments in the comments below um, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. And if you like what we do, please subscribe to the channel. We upload three videos a week. We talk mostly about music, but we also talk about movies, TV, and all kinds of other forms of media. So if that sounds like something that will be interesting to you, subscribe to the channel and you'll get plenty of that. If you enjoy what we do and you want to support us even more, you can hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, you can support the channel and get yourself entitled to particular perks, such as having your name included in the title crawl of every video on this YouTube channel, having priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us a record to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. But as always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Volkswagen, think small. <laughs>